this at the Red Line March at the end of yeah. COP21 with Naomi Klein. Uh, Naomi, I wanted to ask you, after this two-week experience here in Paris, what do you think climate activists can learn for the future? Well, I think today is a clarifying moment. Um, we, you know, we didn't come to this summit begging our leaders to save the world. I think we came here with our eyes open. We knew uh, that what they were bringing to the table would not lead us to a safe world. We knew there was this huge gap between um, what they were saying about keeping temperatures below 1.5 or 2 degrees um, and what it would take to do so. Um, but even so, you know, it's always amazing to see them fail. You know, to see you know version after version of the text that says nothing about the carbon budget, that says nothing about the need to leave carbon in the ground, the need to keep you know, oil, gas, and coal in the ground, the vast majority of the known reserves. And so people here are um, you know, not crying, they are not in despair, they understand. We understand that this just means we have to work so much harder, and we need to do what our politicians won't do, which is stand up to the power of fossil fuel companies erode their power. So, you know, we, we need to do this on multiple fronts. We need to do it um, in the streets. We need to do it in the forests, on the seas. And we've seen this. Um, you know, we've seen pressure uh, from kayaktivists, from people surrounding Shell's Arctic drilling rigs, um, you know, eventually lead to that company pulling out of drilling in the Arctic in Alaska. Stat Oil just announced that they were pulling out of uh, Alaskan oil drilling because they don't want this terrible bruise on the their reputation, um, the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline. Every single major tar sands pipeline is facing massive community resistance led by indigenous people. One of the things we have learned is that our, co as our coalitions need to be so broad. Um, you know, we need to change what a climate activist looks like. We need to look like the diversity that is, um, you know, our countries, our cities. Um, so, you know, these are the lessons we're learning. Some of them we knew before, but it is always a clarifying moment to realize that we have no leaders. You know, our leaders don't lead. Our leaders have failed us. They have failed us completely. Um, and so the leadership has to come from below, has to come from the communities. Um, and so it, it's going to take that direct action. It's going to take fossil fuel divestment. It's going to take action in the market, pulling money away from fossil fuel companies, making them look like risky investments. And it's going to take actions in the courts with, with um, you know, a wave of prosecutions of fossil fuel companies like Exxon that knew about climate change, lied, spread disinformation, got in the way of action. Um, we need to change the dynamic. We have to weaken the power of the force we're up against. We're here in the city that likes to call itself the city of human rights. Uh, for such a city, protests like this have been rather difficult over the past two weeks. And moreover, in the final agreement, it's likely that human rights have a very little role, if any role at all. So maybe do you have some thoughts on the role and importance of free speech and human rights when it comes to uh, climate change and combating climate change? Well, you know, these past two weeks have, um, you know, have, have this really been a battle between this corp these corporate solutions to climate change, so-called solutions, because they're not solutions. They will not lower emissions um, in, in line with science, but they will continue to enrich existing elites. Um, so you have the agribusiness companies talking about climate-ready uh, GMO seeds, and you have, um, you know, the, the gas industry and the nuclear industry presenting themselves as the solution. Um, and at the same time, as the, that, those groups, uh, those interests, have been given a megaphone inside the Bourget, uh, the French government muzzled or tried to muzzle uh, the people who had other solutions, agroecological farming, uh, energy democracy, community controlled, energy justice, frontline communities um, owning and control their own renewable energy projects public transit, all of this. And instead, we heard a lot from Bill Gates. We heard a lot from Richard Branson. Um, and there has been this blanket protest ban. But today is really a victory because people have pushed back against it. They've pushed the limits. They've protested anyway. They made it clear that it would be a public relations disaster to this government on the final day of their big photo op um, if they had a smash up with the cops. And so against their wishes, um, they lifted the protest ban. Uh, and here we are in a major shopping street that's been closed down in the middle of Christmas shopping season, and we're probably doing more to lower emissions than they are just by closing down shopping on Saturday. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> um, 
La last question, we're, we're here gathered in a context uh, of war, at least the President of France would like to claim that this country is at war. Certainly uh, aggressive action is being taken against other countries uh, not so far away from here and some people have pointed to the role of climate in what's going on in Syria. Do you think we're entering a new age of climate wars, uh, wars over resources, scarcity of resources? Um. We know that climate change was a driver of the outbreak of civil war in Syria. Syria um, had experienced its worst drought in recorded history uh, in the run-up to war, which led to massive crop failure uh, and an internal migration of between 1.5 and 2 million people. Um, and, you, and, and when you have that kind of uh, resource scarcity and when you have those kind of internal migrations, you are and you already have tensions. And you know the tensions in that region have a lot to do with previous wars that have been fought to gain access to fossil fuels, which is the very driver of climate change. Um, so you have a kind of a pincer, two forces coming together. One, the destabilizing impacts of the quest for fossil fuels. And then on the other side, you have the destabilizing impacts of the successful burning of those fossil fuels, i.e. climate change. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, we have to understand that when we talk about climate change, it's not just about things getting hotter or things getting wetter. It's about things getting meaner. When you have scarcity like that, um, you have conflict. Uh, so, you know, we have to understand that we're talking about an, uh, um, not just extreme weather, but an extreme world if we allow temperatures to continue to increase. Okay. Naomi Klein from here in Paris at the Red Line March. Thanks very much. Thank you.